Viewing or listening to this podcast confirms acceptance of the disclaimer visible on your screen or found at authorscott.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the Regaining Health and Humanity podcast. I'm Dr. Scott Johnson, your guide on this journey to natural well-being. Here we explore evidence-based insights, revolutionary breakthroughs, and powerful health strategies that not only inform, but inspire change. Together, we'll uncover the mysteries of human existence and unlock the secrets to thriving. This podcast is more than just knowledge. It's your catalyst for unleashing extraordinary potential. Get ready. Your journey to boundless health and happiness starts now. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the Regaining Health and Humanity podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Johnson, and today we have a human interest story, but one I think many can relate to, that of refinding yourself after divorce. This episode also deals with making mixed and blended families work. So I'm excited to have my friends Chelsea and Bedford Dorr as my guests today. After going through a divorce at age 22, Chelsea spent time learning to love herself and view herself as worthy of love. While facing discouragement as a single mom dating, she met Bedford, who connected well with her son from the previous marriage. And the two fell in love and got married. Today, they are a blended family of seven, hoping to help others love regardless of skin color. Their relationship is evidence that you can thrive after divorce and build deep connections as part of a multicultural family that embraces diversity. Welcome, Chelsea and Bedford. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. I've had you guys on my short list of people I wanted to uh, interview um, just because I, I know you guys both and have had interactions with you. Bedford and I have worked together um, with a youth program. And so um, I'm interested in learning more about your story and how you guys make things work, because I'm sure you're not the only ones that uh, make a blended family work and um, have to deal yeah. with two, two different cultures. So thanks for, for taking some time to, to discuss what I feel is a really important topic. Thank you. Thank you for we having We obviously feel like it's very important too. But. Of course. So Chelsea, my first question is for you. What are some challenges that arise after a divorce that people may not necessarily think about? I think it really depends on your dynamic when you're getting divorced. So I think it depends on how healthy your divorce was. Like, was it amicable? Was it a mutual decision? But then also, do you have children? How many assets are you trying to divide? You know what I'm saying? So I think that there are so many variables in that scenario that it's really difficult to speak to like the masses as far as divorce is concerned. But for me, I feel like... um our baby woke up. I'm going to answer this question. He'll be right back. I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, but for me, I feel like when it comes to divorce, some of the things that people don't really talk about, and maybe this is something that we can talk about a little bit more in depth later, is like the support that people need is not always the support that you think that people would want, if that makes sense. And so right. when I was reading over the question list that you had sent over, um, I think that this question pairs really well with the one where you're talking about how to support people because mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of people in my life. My divorce was not super great. I My ex-husband had an affair. And um, so that was like something that I needed to navigate also having a child. But right. I think that um, people wanted really badly to be like, oh, well, they suck. Like he's the worst. Like he, you deserve so much better and you're going to find someone great. And that really wasn't the support that I wanted at that time, nor was that the support that I needed. And I know that people were very well-meaning in that aspect, like wanting really badly to support me. Um, but really, I just wanted people to like say, I'm really sorry that that's happening to you. And so I think that that is something that people don't necessarily like anticipate needing. Does that make sense? Like I, I really thought that I wanted people to be like, oh, this is horrible. Like he's mm -hmm. the worst. But really I didn't want that. I did just want people to like sit in it with me. In my situation, the hardest part was dating again, having children. Um, that was really hard for me. Like that was really hard to navigate, but that isn't necessarily applicable to everyone. But for me, it definitely was the hardest part. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that there are, are men who probably look and say, 
I don't really want to jump into having children right up front. And so it might uh, just add some, an extra dynamic to that dating and trying to figure things out. And it's interesting how you say you you mainly just wanted people to kind of sit with you in it, maybe have some empathy for what's going on and maybe listen and be there to, to just be a support rather than, oh, this person is terrible and, and try and talk your way out of it. Even in like the worst of divorce circumstances, you're separating from someone who you loved, right? right? And if you loved someone correctly, it's not a switch. It doesn't just flip off. It doesn't just stop. It doesn't end. It's not, um, it is very like, it was unconditional, right? And so um, you are walking away from the situation, which is incredibly painful. So to have people come in and say like, oh, it's going to be fine. Because essentially that's the sentiment of it. Like, oh, they're missing out, you know, was difficult. But I think that that was actually too something that getting divorced, I didn't really anticipate is how, especially because of the reason we were getting divorced, I didn't anticipate how much I would still love that person, Mm -hmm. even though this was the right decision. We were making the right choice. I was making the right choice by like respecting myself and respecting my boundaries. Um, And regardless of how much it hurt, like I didn't anticipate how much I would still care for this individual. And so that's what makes it so tricky is Mm -hmm. that you are trying to maybe make the right decision while also still trying to navigate caring about someone. So Mm -hmm. that is also very tricky. But back to what you were saying, I think that, you know, when you're getting divorced and you have children, I was 22 when I got divorced and I had a son. Most people my age had never even been in a serious relationship, let alone been married and had children. Um, And I always had to remind myself that it was totally okay for someone to say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like that is not for me. Like that was not offensive to me. I couldn't let that affect my self-worth that people Mm -hmm. didn't necessarily want to be with me because I had a child. It just meant that that was not a commitment that they were ready to make at that time. And I think that that's okay. I mean, certainly we wouldn't want to enter into a relationship with someone that wasn't in the right headspace or frame of mind to care for a child anyways, especially a child that was not biologically their own. Yeah, that totally makes sense. You've mentioned kind of some of the ways that you felt like you could be supported during this process. But I think from somebody on the other end, when you have a friend or a loved one that is going through a divorce, sometimes you feel paralyzed. Like, what can I do? I I don't even know how to help this individual. And so what counsel or advice would you give to another individual that wants to support their friend or family member through this, uh, through a divorce? So the best things for me was when people were very communicative and everybody's going to respond to this differently because I know that there are a lot of people that you'll say, how can I help you? And they'll say nothing. You can't do anything. And that's not super helpful for somebody. But for me, it was being very communicative with me essentially. Cause sometimes like, cause as you go through the grief process, you need different things. Mm -hmm. And so there were times that I wanted Jack's like right next to me. I just wanted him to be with me. I didn't want him to go anywhere. And then there were times that I was like, I need a break. Like I need to have a meltdown. I need to not carry this like fake persona. Like I need to be able to just be by myself. Um, so, oh, we're back. So having people, um, ask and say like, what version of me do you need right now? Sometimes Mm -hmm. I needed someone to remind me that I deserved more, that I deserved to be happy, that like this wasn't a me problem. Sometimes I needed somebody to just sit and listen to me because I was upset and just tell me that they were sorry that this happened. Sometimes I needed somebody to take my kid. had friends and my mom and my dad. Their question was, what version of me do you need right now? And that was very helpful for me because then I could base what I needed from them off of how I was currently feeling, which probably was different than like the 10 minutes prior to that. But like it, it helped me fit my needs better. Um, so that's what I would recommend is just asking people like, what do you need from me or what version of me do you need? I'm just here to support you. Um, but I do want to be what you're wanting or what you're needing. And that I feel like makes it easier for people to communicate that. So I love that because sometimes I think maybe we're afraid to ask that question. We're afraid that we'll offend them or whatever, but the direct approach sounds like it's better. Just say, what do you need? How can I best support you? And then you can receive the direction you need as a friend or a loved one of that individual to help them in the way that they need at the time. So yeah. I think that's great. And there were lots of times that I said nothing. And like, really, I probably needed a million things, but I just didn't know. 
what that was. I didn't know what I needed because at the time it just didn't feel like anything that somebody could give was going to repair what was happening. And so um, it didn't really matter. Like you could have given me anything and it wouldn't have like adjusted anything within me. So it doesn't hurt in a situation like that to say like, okay, well, I know that this person really loves, you know, a Coke. Cookies. Right. Whatever. And like <laughs> drop it off as a means of saying like, I'm thinking about you and I love you. Maybe it doesn't move the needle, but maybe for you it does. And maybe it does. Right. So, um, but I think that that is the best part of that is just asking, just saying like, Hey, what do you need for me? How can I help you? And kind of going from there and then just letting them guide that path. Uh, what did you find was important for you in healing from the emotional impact of divorce? And then also maybe can you talk a little bit about what role um, having a new spouse um, helps in overcoming that? Well, I feel like it's an all-encompassing um because the trauma, and again, I think that this is going to look so different for everybody because sometimes people will come to me, okay, so we're full-time content creators, and sometimes we'll receive messages from people that will say, you know, um, I'm so scared to get divorced because I'm scared that I'll never find another person. Mm. Like, I'll always be by myself. And my response to that is always like, whether or not you find another person is not a reason to get divorced or not to get divorced, right? So we're not going to base that decision based off of the percentage or likelihood that you might end up by yourself. And so my path to healing looked very much like I wanted to be okay on my own. Like I did not want to need another individual. I didn't want to go into another relationship as like a Band-Aid to deal with my feelings. And so um, I kind of just allowed myself to feel what I needed to feel for a long period of time. And sometimes that was like not getting out of bed and really struggling. And then sometimes it looked a lot better than that. But I think that that's like the biggest piece for me. It was like really recreating who I was, what I liked, what music I loved, what I liked doing in my spare time what my favorite food was because I was an individual again, instead of like a, a unit and in a married like dynamic, right. You kind of just become an us, which is great. But in a lot of ways you forget the individual and that was really important for me. And so, um, you know, that being said, that is what I needed going into a new relationship is I needed him to know that I had a very firm idea of who I was and what I wanted in a relationship. Yeah. Um, and that I wasn't like hinging on this past relationship. I think divorce tends to make people feel less than, right? All of a mm. sudden there's like this lack of value because you're like, well, if I was worth it or if I had value or if I was enough, then this would have worked. Like this person would have stayed with me. They would have loved me enough. So that was another thing that I really had to solidify for myself is that like I was good enough. I deserved to be loved by someone else. I was important. I had value. Like. Um, before I went into another relationship because I didn't want to rely on somebody else to give me that permission to love myself. But having a supportive partner, I guess I didn't realize that my last relationship was like mediocre because <laughs> it was all I really knew um, until I married Bedford. But like having a partner that understands that I've been through a divorce, understands that I've experienced infidelity, understands what my history looks like um, and being very willing to support me through that because there are side effects that just kind of hit, like they stay with you right? Sure. for a long period of time. And he is really great at that. Like, so having a partner that's willing to go into it with you and say like, okay, I understand. I understand like what your triggers may look like, et cetera. And like agree to support you through that is very valuable. So I would say anybody that's looking at that should have those conversations way in advance <laughs> and saying like, these are my experiences. This is kind of what I've gone through. This is maybe what I need in a relationship. What can I offer you so that they don't, get surprised by it on the back end. <laughs> right. Bedford, I want to hear a little bit from you um, and get your perspective because I think it's a little bit different dynamic when um, you're dating an individual and there's really two people you have to win over in the relationship, right? Um, so it's kind of double duty for you. So tell me maybe a little bit about how you met and what it was like trying to build a relationship with both, che both Chelsea and her son simultaneously. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> anyone that's followed our platform at all knows that we we met on Tinder. 
So mm-hmm. uh, we were swiping and uh, I fancied her, she fancied me. And all of a sudden it said it's a match. And so when I was messaging her to go on our first date, which happened on the 24th of July. So those of you who are not in Utah, that's a holiday in Utah, right? So it's Pioneer Day. Um, we both were in banking at the time. And so we both had the day off and I figured, hey, let's go uh, meet and have some breakfast. Um, and in that first conversation, while I was driving up, she texted me and said, hey, I'm bringing my son. So I was like, all right, well, okay, this is not what I was initially inquiring into, right? I didn't really sign up for this. Um, wasn't high on my list of things to do. And quite frankly, my first thought was, all right, well, I'm going to take her and her son on a date. And then maybe I won't text her back. <laughs> um, but it turned out, you know, we had ourselves a good time, right? And and now I'm married and Jax is along for the ride. And so, um, you know, I think the biggest thing was understanding like, yeah, she's gone through a lot of stuff. Um, and Jackson has gone through a lot of stuff as well. And I think the unique thing about us meeting all together at the same time is uh, there was never a time for me to consider whether or not he was going to be part of the deal or even think about it. He was just always there. And so um, that made things a lot easier. Also, he was a phenomenal two-year-old. I, I promise if it was any of our other kids, <laughs> it might not have worked out. But he is just such a well-behaved, so much fun. We had a lot of time um, together, and we we just had a whole lot of fun. So it it was something that I, you know, definitely was winning him over, and more so he won me over. We were having just so much fun all the time. And the whole time we were just building something that I didn't think would last not even the end of that date. But now we're here 10 years later, and we're having a good time. That that's a great story, and I'm I'm glad that you shared it. And um, hopefully people can learn from maybe – you maybe didn't have those expectations going into the date, but it turned out right for you and, and good. And so sometimes maybe pushing through things that are different than what you expected leads to a great outcome that you couldn't foresee in the beginning. So tell me a little bit more about how you ensure your children maintain a strong connection to the heritage of both parents. You know, I think that heritage wise for me looks a lot more basic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that people uh, like, especially online, they want to say like white people lack culture. And I don't necessarily believe that that's true. Um, Because, you know, you still celebrate holidays and you still have all of these other, but we also work really hard to include holidays that are very like, exclusive for him. So like Mm -hmm. January 1st, even though it's New New Year's, Year's. it's actually Haitian Independence Day. And they always make a soup on Haitian Independence Day. And we always go over there and have the soup because it is a big deal for his Mm -hmm. family and for Haitian people. And so um, we like we try really hard to make sure that we're not just celebrating things that are pertinent to, you know, the average American, but we are celebrating things that are valuable for Yep. Like for Haiti, right? Um, and then I think on the flip side too, growing up how I grew up with Haitian parents, right? Both of my parents are from Haiti. Um, we've always tried to celebrate the normal American holidays, mm-hmm. um, but we maybe have always had a Haitian twist to it. And so I remember the first time I brought Chelsea <laughs> over to Thanksgiving dinner, um, we didn't have any. We didn't have any pie. No. Oh. Pie. No How can pie. you have Thanksgiving without pie? No pie, no drinking. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. <laughs> We've always had like a Haitian feast. So okay. lots of douille sauce poire, lots of uh, plantain, lots of right. our mm. native, you know, meals. We we have a Haitian feast. And then it was like, huh, she we got no pumpkin pie, no apple pie. We we really <laughs> don't even have any turkey. <laughs> like, wow. And so those are kind of things that we had to become cognizant of. Like, not only are we going to celebrate, like, in, you know, the Haitian way and some of the Haitian culture that we have that we're super proud of, but we have to also remember, like, like we want to celebrate Chelsea's way. We want to celebrate right. normal things in the way that Chelsea has been able to to experience them for her life, right? We don't want her to think, oh, man, I'm going to Thanksgiving with the doors and we're not going to have any of the things that I'm used to. And so. Um, we are trying to be aware and I'm sure there's been plenty of times still, even after 10 years that we're like, "Mm, probably could have done this better. (laughs) Um, but I think a lot of it comes with communication and 
just not necessarily setting expectations or rules or guidelines, but like just having open conversations about how things feel. Like, did we do enough of this? Did we not do enough of that? What could we have done better? Kind of debriefing. And I think that's something that we do relatively well. I'm sure there's room for improvement, but we, we talk a lot. I feel like a lot of it is just intentional exposure. And I think that a lot of parents lack that because, I mean, obviously from our point of view, and this is maybe something that comes up later, but even white parents with white children should intentionally be exposing their children to other cultures and other like ethnicities and other like types of upbringing, different like traditions, those types of things. Um, because then it eliminates some of the experiences that our children have where people are like, why are you brown? Why is your hair messy? Yeah. Right. Um, or like, why would, why do you celebrate that? Or because then they're learning those things at home. Right. I think that of course for us, it definitely is just intentional exposure to all of the things that we have the opportunity to. We take, we like them all by the house. We'll do like cultural festivities and you go mm-hmm. over and they have food. And so we take our kids to stuff that's not even relevant to us because we think that that's valuable. So it's just a matter of being intentional about what your children are viewing. I like that because uh, in my career, I, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and experience different cultures. And that's one of the things I always enjoy. And I try and talk to the people that live in the countries I go to and learn about, you know, what are the foods you guys really like here? And what are some of the things you celebrate and, and what do you do differently than Americans? Just because I'm I'm interested and curious in how other people live and and I, I think it makes us better people when we have a, a an understanding of different cultures and how other people do things yeah. in life, um, because we tend to have a narrow view of the people that are around us and our family. And, and we think, OK, everybody's like that. And that's just not the way it is. There's yeah. so much diversity and so much uh, that we can learn from other people. So um, I think that's great advice to just expose your kids to different cultures, um, even if you're not a multicultural family. Um, and, and the reality is we probably all are because, you know, I have heritage from England and from Sweden and from Scotland. And so there's there's different heritages that we could talk about there. Can you share some specific strategies for co-parenting across different cultural backgrounds to ensure a balanced upbringing? I think the number one strategy that we've employed is, again, frequent communication. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's very specific to co-parenting. I think it's very specific to marriage as a whole Um, because there will be a lot of time. In fact, I literally just posted about the differences and how we grew up. Um, today that happened. Mm-hmm. So um, there'll be a lot of times where I would approach things considerably different than the way Chelsea would approach it or vice versa. And I think for us, even though it seems like natural, like, of course, why wouldn't we do it this way? It's the way that I was brought up. Again, I was in a different home. I had a different background, vice versa. She was in a different home and a different background. And so um, for us, the biggest thing when it comes to co-parenting with different ways and first cultures and just approaches um, is communication. And so Mm -hmm. there'll be plenty of times where we'll have to pull a side huddle. Hey, time out. (laughs) Maybe let me give you a good example. So culturally for my in-laws, when you see your parents, your grandparents, or literally anyone, you kiss them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like you kiss them on the face (laughs) and my children feel very uncomfortable with that. Right. Okay. But there are certain people where they're like, I don't know you. I'm not doing that. Um, where I was raised in a household where it was not ever really required. Right. Mm-hmm. And not to say that one is better than the other. They're just culturally different. Right. And um, I kind of got to a point where I was like, I am not forcing my children to do this because for me, in my mind, it's teaching them that they do not have the autonomy to choose the affection that they are. Mm-hmm. With, right. Um. And that was something that we had to like meet in the middle because my kids were like, I'm not doing it with grandma, not doing it with grandpa, not doing it, you know? And I was like, no, I'm okay with that. And we teach them like, listen, culturally, that's a very respectful thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And we've had conversations where now his parents will say, can I hug you? So um, there are certain areas that kind of come to a head where it's like, okay, this is culturally important. And then for me, I'm like, actually, it's not. 
and I have some issues with it. And now we have to not just, we're not just talking about a difference of opinion because in culture, there's a lot of things that carry a lot of weight. And so there have been things like that where we've had to say like, hey, how do we navigate this? Where where are we going to meet? Where are our boundaries? Um, and then kind of figure it out from there. And that has happened with quite a few things. Oh, yeah. A lot of things. And so again, it's just for us, it's like, hey, pause, time out. We need to talk about this. And sometimes we come to a temporary solution and then we have a longer discussion. And then sometimes we come to a temporary solution. We're like, actually, no, that worked out really nicely. We're going to move on. Um, yeah. But pausing and saying, okay, how are we addressing this? And quite frankly, I think that's the best way to approach any type of parenting. Um, yeah. Because if we were the same person, we wouldn't probably have married each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine you and your wife, you're not the same. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. You're, you're obviously going to have different ways that you are brought up and we often mirror or mimic how our parents raised us with our own children. And so we've got to work those differences out and come to some kind of uh, meeting or melding of the mind so the parents can actually um, parent in a similar manner. And it's not, well, dad is totally over here and mom's totally over here. And I don't know how to respond to the situation. Yes. But. Yes. Um, you kind of led into a, another question that I wanted to ask about um, extended family members. How can extended family members from different cultures be involved in a way that supports the family's new dynamic? I think like, so for my parents and obviously myself, as I've had children that have very different like hygienic needs than myself. Like they have very different hair care needs. They have very different skin care needs. Like they, like their skin out here is like suffering and mine is mm -hmm. okay. Right. Yeah. So like what I would use for me is not what I would use for my children. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even little things like that for my parents to watch them, um, ask questions, ask questions and try to get it right. Because yeah. I think she's like, no, I want them to thrive. I want them to be happy. And so being willing to ask questions and maybe even being willing to be open to the fact that they're not going to fit exactly in the mold that you may have been used to culturally. Right. So maybe like my parents, for example, having to get used to the kids, not necessarily wanting to throw it on the kiss on the cheek. Right. Yeah. That's just because culturally they're mixed of my culture and a little bit of mom's culture mm -hmm. and you can't really force anything but you want everything to be happy and natural and so being willing to ask the questions what makes them the most comfortable what makes them the most happy um and then being willing to understand that yeah they're not 100 percent of this culture but they can be 100 percent happy and, and we can make the adjustments to make that happen i think mm -hmm. that like you know kind of going back i think that like for my parents it's very like we want them to know because especially within the black community hair is a large it is very important. It is very mm -hmm. important. And, you know, so my parents aren't just saying like, well, what do you want me to do? Because she'll call and she'll say, okay, so I did this. Should I do this? Is this okay? <laughs> like, did you, do you have the products? Because she genuinely wants her grandchildren to be themselves, to feel like they are who they want to be. And so I think that it's very much guiding your family to have a well first of all i think it's just desire like natural desire that most family members have for their grandchildren or their children or aunties uncles right nieces. like mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. everybody you know it's this genuine desire to care about them and want what's best for them and then after that it's just lovingly guiding them in the way like and so it's just gentle education right and i know a lot of people really struggle with this like we get a lot of questions on our end from people that this just did not work for them like their family members very much do not try to support or change or meet in the middle or negotiate when it comes to culture or mm -hmm. so i know that we're very blessed in that way um, but I, in the end, I'm a very firm believer that what matters is what we say, because we are ultimately the ones that want to keep our children safe. We want to protect their emotions. We want to protect everything that is them. And if there are people outside of that, they cannot get on board with that, then that's fine. But Just might need a little extra space. We, right. we will always support our children and what is best for them. So 
Yeah. That, that kind of leads me into my next question. I wanted to talk a little bit about navigating uh, potential identity conflicts that can occur among children. I spent part of my childhood growing up in California and um, in, in one of the cities that we lived in was a very small town in Northern California. And I was actually a minority at my school. <laughs> and so um, I've been uh, in the flip of that situation um, to, to where I ended up finishing high school and junior high where um, I was a majority. But how do you how do you help your kids when they do maybe come up with some of these identity conflicts that they experience um, as part, being part of a multicultural family? I think that as a mixed child specifically, like there's two different realms here. I think that first of all, like our children are mixed. And mm -hmm. so they fall in that category of sometimes not white enough for the white people and not black enough for the black people, which mm -hmm. is really difficult. Um, you know, they have people that are telling them like, you're not really black or they have people that, you know, they're not. not white. So you have that identity that is really hard, like trying to reconcile the mixed version of themselves and figuring out where they belong. But then you also have this separate part of belonging or maybe identity issue that comes in where they are the minority here by a lot. Um, and so two years ago, our son was seven mm -hmm. and he came home from school and he was like, I want to be white. And I was like, what? Hmm. And he was like, I just want to be white. And he's like, I'm sick of people asking me why I'm brown. I'm sick of people touching my hair. And he was like, nobody touches the white kid's hair. Like, nobody. And I was like, okay. And so he was like, I just think it would be easier. And I was like, okay. And so you have these two different realms where they're trying to deal with this, like, identity issue surrounding being mixed. But then they're also trying to deal with the identity issue of being a minority. Um, and so for us, I think that... The most important thing is like allowing them to have a voice in how they're feeling and not dismissing those feelings. So that has been the most important thing, especially for me, because, you know, there's this tendency to be like, honey, that it doesn't matter. You're so special, you know, mm -hmm. but it really does matter. And it is something that will continue through the rest of their lives. So it's important to validate them and say, I can see why that would be incredibly frustrating for you. Like I can see why that would be really hard. And then something that's been valuable for us is to help them problem solve so that they know how to deal with it at school instead of me calling the school or we say like what is something that you could say when someone touches your hair and mm. you know our kids are getting really good at saying please don't touch my hair <laughs> yeah um and like Back. utilizing their voice to really make it so that they don't feel like people just have the autonomy to do that um, yeah or when people say your hair is crazy or messy like kids because they don't know better our kids have mm -hmm. gotten really good at saying actually it's curly just so that they are offering that correction so that maybe in the future that changes. And I do think that those little things, like giving them a voice both with us, but also to help resolve some of their discomforts, um, I think that that's very powerful for them in helping them to establish like an identity. What advice would you give to someone who's feeling maybe overwhelmed by the process of trying to integrate two cultures into their family life? I think just take it slow. You know, you don't have to do it all in one. Well, not only you don't have to, you can't. You can't. Right. And it's not. We're necessary. still doing it 10 years later. So <laughs> it's not, it's not necessary. And I think that there are some external things that make that navigation a little bit more intense. Um, I will say that like um, the pressure from like in-laws that are very much in that culture or have married within the same culture, um, you know, to like, do things a certain way because you've always done things a certain way. So like that outside external pressure um, can sometimes feel so heavy that it makes you feel like you need to get a result right now. Like we just need to figure this out because it's causing so much tension in between like us and my family. And um, I think that for me, and you can 100% say if you feel differently, but for me, when we got married, this was my new partner. Like, we were a new family and we were navigating how we felt about everything together, <laughs> regardless of the external pressures that are around us. And so while those can be very intense, I would sooner tell someone that was applying those pressures in my life, we need to take a break. We need some space because we are not feeling supported in how we have chosen to do things before I would argue with my partner 
about how those external pressures are making me feel the need to hurry and make decisions or do things in a way that I'm not ready. So I think that's what I would say. Go slow. You don't need to do it all at the same time. And if there are like forces in your life that are making you feel like you do, or they're causing stress on your marriage because you are not doing things the way that they would like them, they're as much as it is hurtful in some situations, it's this or that. And this is what we chose, right? So, and we've had to do that. We've had to, on from both sides of our family, we've had to say, we are not on the same page. We are feeling a lot of pressure. So we are going to take a step right. back until we can get on the same page because this is more important. Right. What strategies can couples use to address and manage external societal pressures or prejudices? Yeah. I think that's a great question. I think, again, the number one thing that you could do is, A, communicate with your spouse, right? Again, when I'm, I'm going to harp that over and over and over again. Communication is key. We have these conversations darn near every, every day, probably. Every day. <laughs> um, and then... I think as well, it does help to find other couples that are going through the same yeah. thing, um, which is beautiful now, especially with the day and age that we have social media and, and you can really, you know, no matter where you live, you can get into contact with people that are going through very similar things and have conversations with them and find some of their wins or just commiserate. Sometimes it's just simple to be like, not the only one and that's okay, right? Sometimes that's a good enough feeling. Um, but those two things, like have a conversation with your spouse, let him or her know how you're feeling and then find other people that might be in the same situation and have conversations with them. And what you might learn as well as you talk to other couples is, um, a lot of the issues that we have aren't necessarily specifically because of our, our multicultural, but there's a tie back to just the fact that we were raised a little bit different, mm -hmm. which is more universal. You know, amongst marriages, probably than anything else. Absolutely. Like two separate people. And then when you start having those conversations, you're like, wait a second, I'm not pigeonholed. I'm not exceptionally unique. You are. But like some of these issues that you run into, there are mirrors and there is copycats of them. And as you talk to other people, you're like, oh my goodness gracious, that solution that they found for this problem actually fits us really, really nicely. And, and so just being willing and open and vulnerable. Um, to having those conversations goes a long ways is what I think. Yeah, I think um, I think it really does for me come back to like being very solid in, and that, that's a communication thing, very solid in what is important to us. And so an example that I might give is that, um, you know, I, a lot of what I do is online and I would get a lot of comments from people saying like, especially black individuals, right? They would comment and say, you're not doing this right or you're not mm. doing this right or like they they deserve better care in this arena, which I'm always very open for. But in the beginning of my career doing this, it would break me. Like, mm. I remember going to Bedford one day and just saying, like, do you even trust me to raise our kids? <laughs> because I'm getting so much negative feedback about myself as a white mother to interracial children. People would say, like, what happens when something happens to them? that is like racially motivated, you can't even relate to them. And that's a truth. That is a very strong truth that we have had to reconcile. Um, you know, what does that look like for me as their mother? But I felt so intimidated by that. And that was probably one of, and we, our kids were very, very little at that time. And that was probably one of my very first experiences where I realized how important it was that uh, we <laughs> were on the same page and that it didn't really matter what anybody else had to say. Like, obviously if you have really great advice and you are well-intentioned and you genuinely just want something better for us and you would like to give us advice, that is different. But when it comes to like people's opinion, I mean, every day on the internet, somebody comments and says that black people and white people shouldn't get married every day. <laughs> yeah. um, and if you are not solid in who you are as a couple, why you love each other, like what is important to you, what kind of kids you want to raise, then the forces of the world will give you whiplash. Like you will never be solid in any one space. And so if there is somebody, you know, as people are experiencing like the adversity and the, like all of the judgment and the prejudice and all of those things, it really does just come down to like, what do we believe and what's important to us and what kind of kids do we want to raise? And then after that, your opinion about me is your problem. 
you know? Yeah. You have to, I guess, have a little bit of a thick skin because like you're saying, you're going to get it from both sides. Um, yes. And it's unfortunate that that still happens. Um, I, th I think people just um, are ignorant is yeah. probably the best word to say. Yes, ignorant, um, very stubborn. It's, I mean, we've already said it, like you kind of become a product in a lot of ways of your parents, right? And mm -hmm. so the way that you were raised, the belief systems that you were like taught growing up, um, those all without a significant amount of work to rewrite what those belief systems look like, those become a part of who you are. And so there is, you know, that, and then on top of like the stubbornness and the like unwillingness to maybe grow, change, waver, improve. or like, you know, educate yourself at all. And so that's the world. That's everybody is just a product of how they were raised unless they choose to change. And a lot of people don't. And so, you know, you look at the world race wise and like historically, and obviously it requires someone along the line to change and say, no, this doesn't work for me. Right. Like I don't mm -hmm. want raise children like that. So, um, and we've seen that, like we've seen that in very positive ways as well. So I don't want to make it sound like it's all negative. We, um, for a while I was teaching courses for people to talk to their children about diversity and mm -hmm. how to have those, some of those tough conversations, how to introduce it to your children. Um, and we had tons of white parents, with white children that showed up and said, we really want and our said, kids to I learn really this. want to know because I want my kids to be better than my parents and I want my kids to be better than me. So there are mm -hmm. people that are totally doing the work. They want it to look different. In the beginning, I cried all the time. And now it's almost impossible to hurt my feelings at all, <laughs> uh, um, which is unfortunate, but also kind of a gift, I guess. <laughs> Well, I kind of talk a little bit about that in the book I wrote called uh, Regaining Humanity and how that we tend to see things through the lens of how we were raised, the culture we were raised in, but also uh, we each have just an innate preference for people who look and act and behave and have the same interests as we do. And whether we recognize those biases or not, they are there inside every single person. And so it just takes effort to one, become aware of them, but yep. then two, start to change and shift your thinking a little bit to be more accepting of people who don't maybe look and act and behave the exact same way you do or have different ideologies and beliefs than you do. I think that um, when I was when I was teaching these courses, part of it is is that a lot of parents will say like, "Oh, well, my kids would never do that." Like, kids are just inherently good; they <laughs> love everyone, and that is very true in most situations. But along those lines, like children actually utilize the concept of transductive reasoning, right, which follows us into adulthood, which essentially means like children will look at someone and say, "You're a boy, and I'm a boy, so we probably both love football," mm -hmm. or "I'm a boy, and you're a girl." And your favorite color is definitely pink. And so we are not, right? And so they take what they can ascertain from what you look like on the outside and how similar you seem to be. And then they transduct away from that and say, okay, then we must be the same. We must like the same things. And so children at a very young age go to school. And if you do not talk to them about different cultures or disabilities or anything outside of that, they're going to see a black individual or they're going to see, you know, somebody that is Hispanic or they're going to see somebody that's different from them. And they're literally going to be like, I don't get it. We don't look the same. So on the inside, we are likely not the same. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and like that just carries into adulthood. It's like, because that, the reasoning that you utilized as a child becomes part of a belief system. Right. And so it's just important to recognize those things and like the biases that start very early and talk to your kids, right? Like have conversations with your kids. So um yeah, I I completely see how that happens as an adult because it starts when you're little. Well, thank you so much to both of you for being yeah. on. I think it's been a good conversation and, and hopefully one that can help people who are in a similar situation as you are, but also I think um at least I hope that other people are listening and saying, well, maybe I need to explore other cultures a little bit more. I need to yeah. maybe branch out of my own little bubble and, and see the world a little bit. Um, because uh, we, uh, let's be honest, we live in a very contentious 
world right now. Yep. And a lot of that contention is because we are unwilling to see other people and listen to them and, and, and to explore things outside of what we want as an ideal world. And so I hope that people will, will spend more time trying to know other people and um, hopefully eliminate some of that contention that's here. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. This has been fun. I love it. Yeah, this was great. This was a really good conversation. All right. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. I hope you've gained insights to elevate your health and life. For more transformative evidence-based wisdom, I invite you to explore my 20 plus books at authorscott.com forward slash shop. Don't miss out on the chance to supercharge your health and guide others to a better life. Like, Share and subscribe to join the movement Transforming Lives. Here's to your journey toward boundless health and happiness.